For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Okay, guys, we are here on Standing for Truth. I'm really, really pumped for this one. Definitely excited. We've got Dr. Rob Stadler with us. As you can see here from the thumbnail, we are going to be addressing some arguments made by a popular YouTuber, Professor Dave, when it comes to abiogenesis. So before we get into that, though, I'm going to give a brief introduction of our guest, uh, Dr. Stadler. He's received a PhD in medical engineering from the Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology. And of course, uh, Rob, when I'm done here, correct me on anything I may have said incorrectly, but he, he has been a scientist in the medical device industry for over 20 years. And literally millions of his cardiac devices are implanted in millions of patients worldwide. He has also been elected fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biomedical Engineers, has obtained more than 140 U.S. patents, and has 20 peer-reviewed publications. Rob is also the author of two must-read and must-have books that I'm going to show on screen here in one second. Uh, the first one being The Scientific Approach to Evolution, What They Didn't Teach You in Biology, and The Stairway to Life, An Origin of Life, reality check. Definitely two must read books. I'm looking forward to having Rob on again in the future to discuss those books. So they're right here for everybody to see the scientific approach to evolution and the stairway to life. So uh, enough for me. I want to introduce Rob to the show. Rob, thank you so much for giving us your time. We really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me on there. I really appreciate it too. It's great to be here. Awesome. Thank you. It's definitely an honor. We've also got uh, Matt and John here. John has actually had an interview with um, uh, Dr. Stadler on, I believe it was uh, his book on evolution. And I've, I've watched that interview. I, I definitely recommend it. I learned a lot. It was an awesome interview. So John, any words from you there? No, I think uh, if you want to learn more about Dr. Stadler and uh, his first book, which I think is absolutely fantastic and well worth your time to read, puts, puts evolution to, into a very interesting perspective. I strongly recommend head over to my channel and watch our interview and then immediately go and purchase his second book, which is Stairway to Life, uh, which I've read. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, as we go through this video today, a lot of the things that we're going to discuss are expanded upon in great detail and stay away to life. So um, just just keep in mind as you're going through, we're going through this, um, that there's great amounts of substance behind all the arguments and the positions that uh, Dr. Stadler will be telling us about tonight. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much, John, Matt, as well. Thanks for being here. Any words from you? Uh, no, I'm just going to sit back, relax and enjoy this one. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely excited for this one. This is going to be a lot of fun. So we've got a video that we are going to uh, go through. Um, we're going to have Rob here. Uh, Rob, just let us know when uh, any specific spots you'd like us to pause, you know, give your thoughts. Awesome. Okay. So the, uh, the purpose of making this video is actually to provide a, an origin of life reality check to Professor Dave. Um, I, I don't have any misconceptions that he's going to change his mind at all in the result of this video, but he does have almost a million subscribers. And that's really where where my heart is, is to is to make sure that those million subscribers are not misled by what he says in this video. A lot of people appreciate his educational videos on chemistry and physics, and he does a great job there. But but then when he strays from science in order to promote his agenda and trying to promote a natural explanation for the origin of life, um, I think 
that that prompts the need for a video like this. I also wanted to mention that we're not we're not here to defend uh, Dr. Tor, Jim Tor, that that Professor Dave kind of denigrates on in his video. We're not here to defend Dr. Tor because he's quite capable of defending himself. Uh, we're just here to correct some of the erroneous statements that Professor Dave makes about origin of life. So I think what, what you're going to hear today is really two main concerns that we're going to focus on. To keep it simple, there's just two things. And the first topic is about bias, because bias is so important in science, and bias often clouds you from getting to the truth in science. So we have to address that. And the second topic is about sensationalism or about embellishing the truth, stretching the truth, half truth. Um, and we have to address that because there's a lot of that going on in Dave's video. So um, Dave, in his video, he makes some statements uh, basically saying that religious people should not be contributing or interpreting uh, data about or evidence about the origin of life. So we have some snippets from Dave's video on the screen now, and I'd like to uh, play the first segment here. Although the reasoning behind his stance on abiogenesis is clearly religiously motivated, despite his best efforts to convince people otherwise, he is entitled to his religious beliefs. It is clear that his religious views cloud his capacity to interpret research on this topic. Okay, hold it there. So um, that went by kind of quickly, but what you see there is Professor Dave calling out Jim Tor for being biased uh, because Jim Tor has said that he's a Christian. And, and to be open in disclosing our bias, the, those of us on this show now also come from a Christian religious background. The trick is, and the trouble is, that when Dave says it is clear that his, Jim Tor's, religious views cloud his capacity to interpret research on this topic, what Dave is basically saying there is that only atheists are qualified to address the science behind the origin of life. He's basically trying to say that only atheists are unbiased and are able to get to the ultimate truth because they're not clouded by their religious backgrounds. So that actually, I think, is, is rather a strong hypocrisy on, on Dave's part because Dave is an atheist and that means he has an absolute materialistic or a naturalistic bias. In other words, if you, if you look at origin of life at the highest level, the big picture, there's really just two hypotheses. One is that life began by purely natural processes. And the other hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis, is that life could not have begun by purely natural processes, which means that something beyond natural processes had to help out. But because of Dave's bias, his atheistic materialistic bias, he blocks the second hypothesis out up front immediately. So all that's left is the naturalistic explanation. And so the data has to support that. And by blocking out a possible explanation and leaving only one behind, that's an extreme kind of bias, which I think is even greater than what Jim Tor has. It's greater than what I have. I think the two possible hypotheses should be left on the table. And then you bring up the evidence and you stack it up and see which hypothesis is best supported by the data. It's certainly an extreme bias to block one of the hypotheses out right up front. So any comments from, from you guys on that? Well, some, something I would add would be, or not really add, just ex expand upon is your point about the bias. I mean, just today I had an interaction with somebody about this topic and their position was that the hypothesis of, hypothesis of the intelligent agent is purely faith-based and there is no remote evidence you could have for it. And it seemed, I find it very interesting. I hear that on a very regular basis. I know we all do. And it's like they forget that on the evolutionary side and the abiogenesis side, it's also being based on deduction and forensic evidence and historic evidence versus actually observed evidence. And the, you know, Dr. Sadler, you do a great job in, uh, in your first book 
really breaking this down from the evolutionary perspective and looking at, you know, talk about the bias and different things, but I find it very, very interesting how the, you know, applying the same standards of evidence that you would in any other aspect of science. And I know you've talked about this in context of your research that seems to fly out the window in the context of things that we're talking about tonight. And then just evolutionary, uh, the theory of evolution in general. Is that, uh, is that a fair statement? Yeah, it is important to keep in mind, you know, if, if you follow the naturalistic, um, the story about origin of life, you're talking about a singular event that they say happened four, four and a half billion years ago. And, you know, there is no remaining evidence of that. There are little hints that they may bring up, but that evidence, you know, is inherently very low confidence. Um, but we do have evidence that we can find in existing life. And we'll talk about that a fair amount, hopefully in the next hour, about the evidence we have from existing life and which of those two hypotheses that the existing evidence supports. And that evidence is directly observable and you can repeat it and you measure it and in, in, in life today. And, and I would like to also bring up that um, in order to be an atheist, in order to be a, a rational atheist, you have to have a natural explanation for the origin of life. In other words, believing that there is a natural explanation for an origin of life is absolutely foundational and fundamental. And if, if that is somehow taken away, then you can't, you could still be an atheist, but I don't think you could be a rational atheist because some kind of something beyond natural had to help out or had to be a part of the origin of life. So my point is there that I think atheists have a much stronger bias coming into this because the very foundation of what they believe is at stake. And I have something to say to this as well. It would be more of a question for anybody listening is if our judgment was truly clouded by our belief, then how come the amount of Nobel prizes are disproportionately in favor of Christians over atheists. If clearly, if our judgment was clouded, we would not be dominating in that area. Well, and I know we're going to go on to the next segment, but uh, one other piece, and, I, and I'm not going to turn this whole uh, stream into a promo for Dr. Stadler's uh, Stairway to Life book, but the uh, something I was really struck by in it as he dove into great detail was the, the plethora of paradoxes that must be accounted for from the purely naturalistic worldview. I mean, it's paradox after paradox. And you, and, and you, you and I have talked about this, Rob, of, you know, you didn't even cover all of them. Mm -hmm. right? And the irony is we seem to be discovering more potential paradox um, that have to be overcome. In the, the deeper we get into origin of life research, the more barriers to entry we seem to be finding rather than solving. And right. to me, that really... It, you know, exacerbates the point you're making of who has more bias <laughs> if right. the and the barrier to entry gets bigger and bigger and you double down and double down and double down on your belief, who is taking the greater leap of faith? I guess is the point I'd be making. And in each of those paradoxes are sometimes called causal circularity or sometimes called chicken and egg phenomenon. Um, those speak evidence toward hypothesis two, right? Which right. because those those paradoxes are unnatural things, yet we know they exist. They point to hypothesis number two. Right. Actually, I was going to touch on that. I'll, I'll say one quick thing, and then, of course, we can move on. But the chicken and egg problems are huge, uh, Rob. I was going to point that out. That's a great point. And the fact that the origin of life, as you point out, you know, once again, in uh, the stairway to life, as, as John was um pointing out the origin of life is extremely low confidence science versus high confidence science. And, and I believe it's in chapter six, you speak and you just um, spoke to this as well, but you go over a number of criteria, six criteria that have been applied to the study of abiogenesis. And you point out, as you just correctly pointed out here, that the origin of life is the, the antithesis of repeatable. It is an event that supposedly occurred on one occasion about 4 billion years ago. But I like how you also pointed out, uh, Rob, that even if modern laboratory experiments could create life from non-life, we would have no confidence that the conditions of the 
laboratory experiments were consistent with those of the early earth. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to point that out because I really liked uh, that in your book. So yeah, if you could do it in a lab today, it certainly would be encouraging. It would be very interesting, but I wouldn't say that that's proof that that is relevant to what actually happened in the original original case. Exactly, I like so, that point. So we're back on the topic of, of bias here, and let's let's play the video forward to the next segment here. Those who think I don't know, therefore God would do themselves a service by stopping after I don't know and learning how to cope with uncertainty. Okay, thank you. So here you have Dave um, basically um, counter arguing against what's called the God of the gaps argument. God of the gaps is basically saying, if there's something that we don't understand, we don't know how this is working, therefore God did it. And Dave saying that's not a good argument. And I totally agree with him on that. Um, I, I don't think that that's an argument that makes sense. And Jim Tor doesn't use that argument. And I, I try not to also, of course. Again, science should be open to follow the evidence wherever it leads. And, and so you should stack up the evidence against the hypotheses and see which is best supported. So following the way that Dave calls out the bias of Jim Tor, he says Jim Tor is, is clouded and he can't you know, be trusted to interpret origin of life data and how he rejects the God of the gaps argument on the slide you see before you here. It then comes as quite a surprise that in the same video, Dave makes the following statement, if you could play it forward again. Okay, right here. So this slide, you can read the text on it. He says about the origin of life, Dave says, we may not know precisely what happened, there is no doubt that it happened totally naturally. So this is, in, in place of the God of the gaps argument, this is kind of the opposite. This is what I call materialism of the gaps or naturalism of the gaps. He's basically saying on the slide, we don't know what happened, therefore naturalism did it, right? So he's, count, he's, he's a, it's, a, it's hypocrisy against what he just said in his own video. And I'm afraid his 900,000 plus viewers are going to be misled by this statement at the bottom here into thinking that it's a solved case, that we have all the evidence to prove that it's natural. And that's completely not the case. This is sensationalism. This is a, a statement of ideology. It's a statement of faith. It isn't science at all. Um, Dave here is kind of showing that he's not speaking about science, but more be, being an evangelist, I think, for atheism. And so uh, you see the hypocrisy here and you see the bias. And that, that's kind of the main point I wanted to make. Well, I mean, I, the only thing I would say is, and, I, and I've heard this, look, I've actually experienced this personally in a debate on this topic. Life exists, therefore the probability is one. <laughs> and I think that's a short way of, a very succinct way of saying that, hey, we believe that because life exists, <laughs> uh, it happened totally naturally. And this here's our evidence. And I think the point you were making a minute ago of the uh, circular evidence and circular reasoning, chicken and egg problem, I think that's uh, embodied in that statement. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, okay, so your answer is the only one? Well, that again comes from taking those two hypotheses and blocking one out up front. And so all that's left is natural, and therefore it's true. That's a kind of a circular argument, right? So... Um, in the second part of this video, I wanted to talk about sensationalizing evidence or embellishing the truth. And uh, Dave makes a statement next on our slide, which I think is, is very interesting. Go ahead, play that. Sensationalist reporting of science news, no matter which way it leans, is destroying public perception of science. Okay, hold it there. So I completely agree with Dave on this point. I think sensationalist reporting of science is destroying public faith and trust and perception of science. Uh, so I agree with him. I think the problem, though, is that much of Dave's video is sensationalist reporting of science. So this, too, is hypocritical. So let's begin. We're going to go through a few cases. We don't have time to go through all of it, but let's, um, let's play the next segment and you'll see what I mean. So here in this slide, you can see at the bottom, it says biomolecules can be self-replicating. And then play it forward a little further. Ribozymes can even perform self-replication. 
That's right, already at this simple level, we are introducing the possibility of self-replication. Okay, hold it there. So Dave is making a claim there that molecules, especially ribozymes, which are RNA molecules, are able to self-replicate. He said it in two places. I find this very disturbing because the fact is that no one has ever seen a true self-replicating molecule. No one ever. And I know we haven't defined self-replicating yet, but I'm speaking from a sort of common sense definition. Let's go to the, the next slide there where we actually have, you know, kind of a boring dictionary definition. But here it says that, you know, according to dictionary.com, self-replicating is reproducing itself by its own power or inherent nature. And then Merriam-Webster says self-replicating is reproducing itself autonomously, which is basically saying the same thing. And Dave is not the first person to claim that there are self-replicating molecules. I pulled this book out off my shelf. It's called What is Life from Addy Prose. And basically he's uh, talking about naturalistic origin of life, but he says in the book here, um, molecular self-replication reaction is a reality a reaction that actually does take place, and most importantly, is autocatalytic. So there are a lot of people that make this claim, and I'm, I'm bothered when I hear it. So I actually went on the comments page of Dave's video on YouTube, and I asked him to please produce evidence to back this claim. And what, what really got me uh, kind of bothered here is that um, Dave responded with, with insults, but then I kept pressing him for evidence and he ended up censoring me and deleted all of my comments from his page. So I'm not able to write comments anymore. And that's really a, a behavior that I never see from scientists. Usually when you ask a scientist for evidence, um, they're willing to try to produce something. So it quite surprised me that that was his approach. His ladies, ladies and gentlemen, that was an extraordinarily nice way of letting Dave know that that was very offensive and that was not very scientific <laughs> from a professional perspective. And a, uh, a PhD is, uh, was asking him a question. The, uh, I don't mean to interrupt you there, Rob, but uh, as you were sitting there saying that uh, very politely, I was always going through my mind of, wow, the, uh, he actually, you actually took the time as a, you know, well-respected researcher yourself to ask him to live up to the standard of evidence that would be expected of you and all of your peers and yeah. he not only dismissed you, he deleted the questions and the challenge to his position. Well, I'd like to think that everybody listening would agree that censoring is not is not a good idea, a, a good process to get to the truth. <laughs> Let's say that. Well, I, I'd like to point out uh, something really, really quick, Rob, if you don't mind, because I see it. I, I think of it as an admittance of defeat on Dave's um side when he responds to your 100 valid question with what with insults and it's not really surprising from what we've seen from professor dave ad hominems seem to be his specialty so rob all you did was ask for some empirical evidence to back up what dave was saying and you got censored and and that's not a it's it, it's obviously not an appropriate approach to scientific discussion so hmm. And so because Dave didn't provide any evidence, I thought we could go through a few papers that I believe also are sensationalizing and I think have misled people into believing the claims that Dave himself made. So uh, if you could forward just a little touch on the video, what we'll see this right here, this is the first paper that kind of got this started. And Sol Spiegelman wrote this paper. This is 1967. We're talking about 53 years ago. Incredible. But the title of the paper is quite sensational. It's a Darwinian experiment with a self-duplicating nucleic acid molecule, and that happens to be RNA. So from that title alone, it sounds like, hey, you've got the data you want. There are self-replicating molecules out there. And when you take the time to actually read these papers, it, it's surprising that they're able to use such terminology as self-replicating, you know, according to the dictionary definitions we showed, and I also think common sense. There's nothing here that is self-replicating whatsoever. In this particular study, um, what was doing the work, what actually replicated the RNA was called a Q-beta 
um, rep, a Q beta replicase enzyme. So this is a protein molecular machine. It's actually made up of four protein subunits. Uh, a lot of people think enzymes are just a single molecule, but most enzymes are actually a complex of multiple protein molecules forming a molecular machine together. So this Q beta replicase actually has 1,200 amino acids um, in the sequence of those four proteins. So it's quite a complicated protein enzyme that he dropped into the solution, and that is what is replicating the RNA. So calling it self-replication seems, you know, a bit disingenuous there. And not only so, there are a lot of other problems with what he found there, and that is that as the RNA was replicated generation after generation by this Q beta replicase, it actually, the RNA actually shrunk over time. It was losing information. It was chopping off because shorter RNAs are naturally going to replicate faster and outcompete the longer RNA. So it's a kind of a devolution, a loss of information. Um, certainly not what you'd expect from a process that could lead to life. So then let's, that's, that's 53 years ago. So what's been accomplished in 53 years since then? Let's go forward. So this paper, this is from Gerald Joyce, who's quite a famous origin of life researcher. And this paper and a whole series of papers like this about this particular molecule have raised a lot of eyebrows, got a lot of attention. But you see the title of the paper here. It says self-replicating RNA enzymes. Again, it sounds like done deal, right? You got your evidence. And you can see the highlighted uh, first sentence there. An RNA enzyme has been developed that catalyzes the joining of oligonucleotide substrates to form additional copies of itself, undergoing self-replication with exponential growth. So there you have it. It's done. But when you actually read the paper, once again, it, it takes a very, very charitable definition of self-replication. To think that's the appropriate title for a paper like this, it takes a very charitable uh, definition. Let's move forward. Yeah, so stop here. So this is this is complicated, and I'll talk you through it a little bit. I don't mean to, there's a lot of detail here, but the yellow part, what you see in yellow there is the ribozyme that he's talking about. It's an RNA molecule. And RNA is made up of four different ribonucleotides that have codes like A, G, U, and you can see those there. So in the yellow, you see a string of 66 ribonucleotides and with the codes. That is a molecule there that was designed by human intellect and passed through, you know, a sort of artificial selection process, a laboratory um, evolution process, if you will, with human intellect pulling out the winning molecules. And so they, they arrived at this molecule because it is it has the property we're gonna talk about. But um, that molecule in yellow is by no means something that you could find in a prebiotic world, in, in a place before life existed, because you know it's extremely complicated. But even looking at just the chirality of this molecule, this is a homochiral molecule and every ribonucleotide actually has four stereocenters, meaning four different locations of chirality, meaning every ribonucleotide has 16 possible chiralities, but only one is, is allowed in life. Only one is used in life. So to have 66 ribonucleotides in a string, all having the exact same chirality, all linked up perfectly like this, um, is, well, it's impossible in a prebiotic world. Basically, if you took all of the mass of the universe, all of the mass of the universe, if it were all con in, all made up of 66 ribonucleotide RNA strings like this, you took all the mass of the universe and randomly had it be 66 ribonucleotide strings, you still wouldn't be able to find one that was this particular molecule because it's that rare, that hard to come by. Now, I'm, I'm getting long-winded here, but what happens now is that in the solution, they put the yellow molecule in the solution, and then in the same solution, they also put the blue molecule and the green molecule, substrate A, substrate B, you can see them there. Now, if your eyes are good, you can tell that A, substrate A plus B combined 
is actually the same as the yellow molecule. It's just flipped over like a, a mirror symmetry there. So they basically put two pieces of ribosome, of, of the yellow molecule, they put two halves in the solution. And all that this yellow molecule had to do was line up the two halves, like you see here, and create one single bond between the blue and the green. And you could see between the blue and the green, there's a, if, you, if your screen has good resolution, you can see PPP. And what that is, is, is a, uh, a triphosphate, a very highly activated um, part of the molecule. It's, it's very eager to bond because it's got this high energy state, which is also rather unnatural. So when the yellow molecule brings the green and the blue in close proximity, that PPP is very eager to bond and it creates a bond between the green and the blue. And then there it is, you have a copy of the yellow. So that is considered by Gerald Joyce to be self-replication. <laughs> so if you if you go to the next slide, I just I th because this is so complicated, I wanted to give you a simple analogy just to explain this. A really close analogy to this would be if I took a, a car, a fully functional car, and I chopped it in half. So you have a front half and a back half. And then where it's been chopped, I put, I install strong magnets and I install some, some mechanical clasp kind of mechanisms between the two halves. So that if you take the back half and you push it against the front half, they would be attracted to each other and the mechanical clasps would come in and it would actually form a, a car that was actually functional. Okay, and then you put behind that, you put a fully functional car and you drive that fully functional car a little bit forward so that it hits the back bumper of the back half and starts to push it forward. And then it bumps into the front half of the car and you hear this click as the two parts come together and there's a mechanical clasp. And now you have a fully functioning car in the front. And if I did that and then I jumped up and down and I said, look at this, I have just produced the world's first self-replicating automobile. That's basically something that I should be laughed at, right? People should laugh at me for making such a silly claim, but that's exactly what has been done with this molecule. And, and so when people claim it's a self-replicating molecule, you always have to read the details and, and appreciate what's going on there because there's trickery to this. You know, and it, and I think it's there because they absolutely have to have a self-replicating molecule or there is no basis for a naturalistic origin of life. Well, it's interesting you say that, you know, we, I know SFT and myself hear this on a very regular basis. The, when, and SFT, Standing for Truth, actually loves using uh, cars and uh, various other uh vehicles as examples for like different uh, hierarchical structures and things of that nature. But uh, the thing we hear on a regular basis is, yeah, well, you're just talking about human designed technologies. We're, we're talking about self-replicating biological systems. And the irony for, I, mean, I know for myself of, you know, the, what you just explained and why it's, such a joke at this point almost of like why in, in any other context you would be laughed out of the room if you made the same argument um and yet they're you know the atheist worldview and even in academia um you know they're doubling down on this position that somehow the self-replication explains how in the heck the uh the magnets and the uh the class mechanism came to exist <laughs> let alone the other parts that are being connected like, hang on a second. What, what are we talking about here? Like, which part are you claiming can be explained through undirected process? Because to me, all of those processes required intelligent agency in order to be executed. Uh, now, the the physical bond at the PPE site, cool, natural forces caused the bond. Congratulations. <laughs> but if to your point you made, if it hadn't been a uh, high energy state, then the bond may or may not happen, have happened or might not have happened at all, right? 
Yeah, it's more likely to go the other way, actually, because it's in a an aqueous solution in water. Um, that that bond actually kicks out a water molecule. And so you're in an aqueous solution that wants to drive it the other way to break apart the RNA. So you have to overcome that with some kind of energy source. And in life, enzymes do that with the help of ATP. That's how it happens in life. And I know we talk about this later, but the, the, the quantum, and there's that whole aspect that you talk about in the book, um, which is starting to finally get focus in academia, but the whole aspect of, you know, hey guys, we've got quantum tunneling going on <laughs> to enable a lot of these uh, uh, reactions we take for granted uh, to occur. There, but, you know, that's another, we're going to detail on that right now, but I mean, that's a whole other aspect of, in my opinion, what's being discovered that kind of puts this whole whole conundrum into an entirely different, uh, it's a whole other stratosphere when you start to think about those kind of things, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say uh, one thing really quick. Uh, Rob, I think you nailed it there. That was really good. Really great. And I appreciate the analogy. I think the audience will as well. It, it made it a lot more understandable. Um, what you said was perfect as well, that they have to they have to have a self-replicating molecule or else there is no scientific basis for an origin of life scenario. And when you think about all the problems, you know, the homo chirality problem, the polymerization problem, the information problem, it makes me wonder at what point do they tap out and admit that they're may not be any plausible explanation for any type of origin of life scenario. So I, I just, I really liked what you said there, Rob. And, and let me add just a little more icing on the cake there that um, it doesn't even make sense to think that a ribozyme, so a ribozyme is an RNA molecule that performs some catalyst function. It doesn't even make sense to think a ribozyme could reproduce itself. And that's because right. In order to be a functional catalyst as a ribozyme, it has to have some three-dimensional shape to it. It's the shape that makes it a catalyst. But in order to reproduce itself, it needs to be a one-dimensional string. So you can add components one by one onto the string and glue them together to make a copy of itself. Um, so that doesn't even make sense. And then you also have this problem called annealing where the, the RNA and its complement RNA um, are held together by Watson-Crick bonds. And once you get to more than about 30 nucleotides, you can't get those bonded complementary RNAs to let go of each other. Even if you boil, boil it at a high temperature, they won't let go of each other. Uh, and nobody's found a solution for that. And, and that's where things like uh, helicase and replicase come into the equation in, in terms of biological, exactly. current biological systems, right? They, they actually, those... Uh, protein enzymes actually cause the separation. Is that for yes. uh, is and that, that right? and that Q beta replicase that Saul Spiegelman had that also does that. It's able to keep to cause that separation because it's a complex enzyme. So so bringing it back to our point here, um, we have Dave claiming that self replicating ribozymes are real, that they're a reality, and my point is that that is sensationalizing and. Going back to what Dave said in his video, he said sensationalist, sensationalist reporting of science news, no matter which way it leads, is destroying the public perception of science. So there you go. So let's go on. Let's go on to some more evidence that Dave presents. With regards to protein production, if catalysis via ribozymes is deemed insufficient, there are plenty of other possibilities. Hydrothermal vents or volcanic hot springs could have provided the energy required for the polymerization reactions. But my personal favorite explanation involves heterogeneous catalysis over mineral-rich surfaces in tidal pools. The small volume of the pools solves the problem of molecules having to find each other in the ocean, acting essentially like a chemist's flask in a laboratory. Okay, so here we're trying to build a protein from individual amino acids. And Dave is kind of hand-waving his way through it to kind of make it sound easy. But you have a problem in that these amino acids, when they join together into a polypeptide, there are multiple ways they can join each other. And only the alpha peptide bond is what we find in life. But when that alpha peptide bond forms, it creates, it kicks out a water molecule. 
So once again, if this reaction happens in water, it's going to be driven backward. It's driven the other way by so much water being around. And you need a carefully directed source of energy in order to make the reaction go forward and, and produce a, a polypeptide. So um, I thought it'd be fun to give a little reality check on this one too. I had a debate with another um, origin of life person, and I was kind of arguing that in the in the years since miller ure experiment, you know, which is now 68 years since miller ure that not much progress has occurred in Origin of Life. And he fought back and said there's been great progress. And he sent me the paper that you see on the screen here. And this paper is about um, forming proteins or forming polypeptides. And um, this is kind of modern example of how far they've come. And so you can see, um, Highlighted here is actually a statement that kind of contradicts what Professor Dave said, but it says the mechanism by which alpha amino acids, which are the ones we found in life, were condensed into polypeptides before the emergence of enzymes remains unsolved. So they're saying they admit we don't know how this has happened, but in this paper, they go on to show what they have accomplished. And what they have accomplished is that they can now take 14 amino acids and get 14 amino acids to link to each other. But they have to be homochiral and the links that they form are not always the correct linkage. It's not an alpha peptide bond. And they've gotten 14 of them. And that's uh, after 62 years since miller ure this paper came out. After 62 years, miller ure had single amino acids floating around. Now, after 62 years, we can now take 14 of them, if they're homochiral, and we can connect them, although not in the way that proteins are connected. Uh, and that's how much progress we have in 62 years. And you can compare that against any other technology in the last 62 years, computing, aviation, medicine, you know, what progress has come in the last 62 years compared to taking 14 monomers and bringing them together into a, a polymer kind of, sort of. So what are the next 62 years going to bring us? 62 years more of funded origin of life research. Now we're going to have 30 amino acids that are kind of hooked inappropriately. Now, Dr. Stadler, can you put that into context of, you know, you, okay, they've gotten 14 incorrectly paired amino acids. How many correct pairings is a ribosome doing? when it's creating a, a, a protein. Like it's, doing, it's, pretty, it's doing it pretty quickly, and usually it's pretty correct and has a relatively low error rate, doesn't it? A very low error rate, and there's error correction schemes in there. So, you know, you can do a 1,000. Like the Q-beta replicase is four proteins that are 1,200 amino acids. So you need 1,200 correct alpha, you know, alpha peptide bonds between 1200 amino acids to make one of those. It's something that I've, I've wanted to have clarified for a while now, actually, is if from a protein formation perspective, if a if it's not the alpha bond that occurs, does the protein formation basically stop and then get restarted? Or can it get past a couple of errors and keep going? Or like, what? how does that usually work in... The actual formation is it kind of a hey i gotta start over kind of perspective or you yeah there's, well there's various error correction mechanisms built into ribosomes that is probably beyond the scope of this discussion but um it, it's true though that if you if you connect them wrongly you end up with what's called proteinoids which is basically you know garbage it's 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 kind of useless um and some people have claimed i've made proteinoids and you know that's a step toward life, but it, it's really just a step toward garbage. I don't think they're getting anywhere with that. So, so even if where I'm kind of where my mind's going with this is, so even well, you're correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're saying is, even if they through natural undirected process, you're able to get more than fourteen uh, bonds to occur. The you only need one unless you could have thirteen of them that were correct. 
And then at number 14, if you have the wrong one, you're screwed. Well, I can't say that, you know, straight up. I think there will be, you know, there could be some enzymatic function, some, some um, catalytic ability of a capability of a molecule like that, but it certainly isn't, you know, what you find in life, you know, in life proteins often form, you know, alpha helices or beta, beta pleated sheets are, are common structures that proteins form. And it's known that if you have the wrong chirality in an amino acid or the wrong bond, uh, you won't get that kind of formation. So the three-dimensional structure will certainly be interfered with. Um, I can't say that the enzyme would be completely useless, but it's certainly not what you find in life. So um, if we can, let's go forward then to the next segment, which is on chirality. But more importantly, the mineral surfaces could have acted as naturally occurring organometallic catalysts. These surfaces may have not only performed efficient syntheses, but given the possibility of the surfaces exhibiting chirality, it could have been the case that they preferentially reacted with one particular enantiomeric version of molecules, like perhaps only L-amino acids. This would readily explain their prevalence in proteins, with enzymes arising later to perpetuate the stereochemical bias after their dominance had already been set into place. Even without this stereospecificity in polymerization, there are other ways to get enantiomeric excess with the amino acids themselves. It has been demonstrated that recrystallization of a mixture of amino acid racemates with a slight excess of asparagine caused amino acids with the same configuration to preferentially co-crystallize. You get a solid containing only one enantiomer and a supernatant primarily of the other. All that's left is some natural filtration mechanism to separate the two and the emergence of autocatalysis in one. Okay, well there. So that's that's a very um, optimistic approach to, to claiming that the chirality problem has been solved for, for proteins. I don't think many origin of life researchers would be as optimistic as Dave is there. But what, what I've never seen talked about actually for me is the most challenging uh, homochirality problem, and that is with RNA. And I mentioned it briefly, but each ribonucleotide in RNA has four uh, chiral locations or four stereocenters. And that means there are 16 possible chiral forms for every ribonucleotide. And I've never seen anyone try to propose how, how a process, a natural process, could select out one out of the 16 possible forms and choose that. Because if you have a solution with all 16 forms in it, you know, the one, the chosen ones that you like will never find each other, will never bond to each other and make a perfectly homochiral molecule. The, the probability is just, is just completely against you. And in fact, in life, molecules that are chiral molecules, over time, they'll, they'll just randomly switch chirality um, and, and so life, in order to maintain life, you have to continually fix these problems. You have to have repair mechanisms. There are enzymes called epimerases and racemases in life. These are enzymes that go around and they fix broken chirality problems. So even if you could get a homochiral molecule, it's not going to last very long. It'll degrade just in water to the point where it's not homochiral. So if, quick question for you. So if I understand what you just said correctly, not only do we have damage repair mechanisms for, you know, actually, you know, deletion or, you know, damage to a nucleotide itself. We also have other ones that come and fix the, it could be the correct one, but the chirality is getting messed up. So there's a, another set of repair mechanisms comes in to fix the chirality, even though it might be the correct nucleotide. Is that what you're saying? That's right. Wow. And there are actually people who have proposed dating methods um, where if you find a protein in some very old, you know, dinosaur bone or something, you could look to see how not chiral that protein is. And that might tell you how old it is because there's a natural racemization over time once something is dead. Well, uh, for myself, I, I definitely have to say just my two cents, you know, looking at these explanations, say from Dave, 
and not just Dave, anybody else trying to defend abiogenesis. Uh, for example, with, with these problems like the chirality problem, for example, I personally see a lot of storyboards and just so stories, hence why uh, specifically you'll hear Dave here say a lot of, you know, maybe this, maybe that, possibly this, possibly that. So I think Dave's unrealistic optimization, as you pointed out, um, Rob, that he seems rather optimistic, is just to deceive his audience into thinking these problems can be solved. Since at the end of the day, a lot of what Dave is saying anyways in this video is probably going over most of his viewers' heads. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just, my, that, that's just my opinion on it. Yes, it, it's, that's quite possible. I agree. So there's just a few more here I want to go through. And, and we certainly aren't covering everything that's done in this video. We're hitting the highlights, but let's, let's move on to the next sequence. Every bacterial cell alive today is tremendously more complex than the first protocell that must have formed. Okay, hold it there. So this term protocell is, is a hot topic also. Um, protocell is essential to help explain a naturalistic origin of life because we know that all known life that we can see today, what we can directly observe today in known life is far too complicated to have come together through a natural process to create that as a, as a cell. It's far too complicated. But here you have Dave kind of stating it as a fact that protocells preceded um, simple life like a bacteria, simple cells that we see today. And the truth is that there, there just isn't any evidence for the existence of protocells. This is sort of a, a materialism of the gaps entity, right? It's created as a, it's an imaginary object to fill in the gap because it is essential. If you're going to have a natural process that creates life that you've got to have these protocells. So protocells, when I hear the term protocell, I think of it like, like a promise in the year of election. It's, it's a promissory note. It's some, it's an imaginary thing that's put forth as a promise that is really not going to be fulfilled. There's no evidence for protocells, but there's actually strong evidence against protocells. Right, and I'd like to explain that. So we know through directly observed um, genetic evidence we have, such as the long-term evolution experiment of Richard Lenski and many others like it, we know that living organisms will try, will over time simplify themselves to be the simplest that they can be and still survive. So for example, in Richard Lenski's experiment, his E. coli bacteria were fed uh, glucose every day. You know, what's for breakfast? Glucose. What's for dinner? Glucose. Every day. And so they have machinery built into them that's able to process ribose. But it turns out they never needed that because glucose was always on the menu. And so they found that in 12 separate um, colonies that were tested in Lenski's experiment, after only 2,000 generations, all of the 12 colonies had ejected the genome, the, the operon that's used to process ribose. And simplifying their genome in that way, they became about 2% more fit, 2% faster at reproducing. So what I'm saying is that these single cell organisms are trying to simplify themselves. And they've been doing that as long as life has been around. And so if you want a protocell, just look at the simple life that we have found living on our planet right now. That's as simple as it's gonna get. It can't get simpler, it's tried, it's already tried. So we have mycoplasma genitalium, which is considered the simplest single cell organism that can autonomously reproduce. Okay, and even mycoplasma genitalium needs to have a kind of a caudal environment, um, but it is able to reproduce itself. So that, that single cell organism contains 468 genes and about 580,000 base pairs of DNA. So 580,000 letters of code in the DNA. And that is a very simple living organism. And people have tried, Craig Venter has tried to take away genes to make a simpler organism, to try to pare it down. Let's try to build a protocell 
sort of reverse engineering from what we have on the planet today. And they haven't gotten very far. They haven't gotten much further below what mycoplasma genitalium has. Because as you start to strip away things, what you do is you have to provide a more and more coddled environment. It has to be just the right temperature, just the right nutrients, everything handed to you on a silver platter in order to keep the cell alive. So these people are trying to make simpler life, but I think they needn't bother to try because nature has already done this. Nature's already come up with the simplest possible life. And you're not going to get any simpler than about 400 genes and about 500,000 base pairs of DNA. So there is no such thing as a protocell, and yet it's absolutely essential for a naturalistic origin of life scenario. I don't know how much we'll be getting into this uh, tonight, and I think that what I'm about to say is worth multiple uh, <laughs> multiple streams on this just this one topic. But you know, in in your book Stairway to Life, um, you know, you get into the membrane aspect and that can the construction process is That's that right. actually self-replicating and the um you know how different proteins are built into i mean the whole aspect of how the proteins partially built uh protected from the water and the other parts in the water i mean in the aqueous solution and stuff i mean to me folks if, folks you probably don't understand what i'm saying most of you go read the book because when you get into this whole section on the membrane formation which obviously is kind of a big deal for the protocells and it's one of the things that the uh, abiogenesis folks claim, oh, wait, we can just create this vesicle and it's no big deal. Um, when you really get into some of the nitty gritty of what's going on in terms of how many proteins are actually making up that wall, making it work, and the processes by which it's actually formed, number one, I think it blows your mind. And number two, it puts, in my opinion anyway, it kind of puts a lot of things that we're talking about into an entirely different context of what is plausible to reach these positions. Well, let's let's carry that out a little further, John, by playing the next segment, because it's about the membrane. The first protocell didn't have to have a single surface protein. The instructions for assembly- oh, Go back there. That, <laughs> so just that simple statement, Dave made a claim that the first protocell didn't have to have a single surface protein. So this gets to what John John was saying, that origin of life researchers will claim that a simple, um, a simple uh, bi bilayer lipid membrane is all you need for a membrane. And no one has ever shown that you can have a living cell that can live with such a, a simple membrane as that. That kind of a membrane would only serve as a tomb for the decaying components that are inside there. Cells have to have active membranes. They have to have active and semi-permeable membranes. So back to the mycoplasma genitalium we were just talking about, that very simple form of life has 140 different proteins that it produces that are operating as part of the membrane. These are active molecular machines that are sending food into the cell and they're sending waste out of the cell and they're keeping homeostasis, keeping the environment inside the cell distinct from what's outside of the cell. That's an active process. It's not just a simple bilayer lipid membrane. And so once again, we have a, a kind of a, a, a materialism of the gaps fill in here by saying that a protocell can have a very simple membrane. There's no evidence that any life could survive with such a membrane. There's plenty of evidence that membranes need to be very complex and need to have lots of proteins as a part of them. Um, I think before you continue, I'll make just one observation also, just to rewind a bit to what you were saying earlier. Uh, when it comes to, I find out what you're saying is, is fascinating when it comes to the mycoplasma genitalium, the simplest form of life on earth. And I'm just going to quote you. Dr. Stadler from your book, because you say it perfectly, this simple life requires the um, choreographic functioning of hundreds of genes to survive and, and uh, reproduce. And what you said there, I completely agree with that this proto cell idea, it's an imaginary thing that is put forth as a promise that at the end of the day will never be fulfilled. Although those like Dave so invested 
unfortunately, in naturalism, and therefore abiogenesis being plausible, hope so badly that it will be fulfilled one day. So, mm -hmm. and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you all do the point that uh, Standing was just making about uh, all of the different genes have to be working in synchronicity. You have multiple paradoxes that are kicking that are being in play in this if I'm unless I'm wrong on that but I mean, we've got the we have the information problem we've got the uh, replication problem we've got the where the heck did the proteins come from problem we've got all sorts of different chemical reaction problems and then we have a lack of accounting for the energy problem uh, in terms of fo focus energy is that right in terms of just a few of the things that we're running into at this point of different paradoxes that aren't being accounted for, but just accepted to have occurred um, in order for this to exist, right? There are layers and layers of paradoxes like that. You know, like a, a cell can produce a protein that has a job of functioning inside the cell membrane, right? They do that all the time. How can a protein get inserted into a cell membrane? Um, the answer is it takes a protein that's already in the cell membrane and other proteins to help insert a protein into the cell membrane, right? So you can't get a protein into a cell membrane unless there is a protein in the cell membrane. This is another circular causality problem that we encounter. There are many. So let's let's go, we're almost done here. We have one more quote about bacterium. Instructions for assembly are encoded in the DNA. Okay, hold it there. So. So what Dave was saying, that was very brief, but what he's saying is that um, a bacterium can assemble itself from the DNA instructions. And this is, this is kind of a half truth. I mean, we all know that the there's a lot of information in DNA, but the simple fact is that DNA on its own can do nothing, right? DNA on its own cannot produce a protein. DNA, on its, uh, DNA can't produce a membrane. Um, DNA needs all of the other tools around it, all the other supporting molecules, and they're interdependent upon each other. DNA on its own will simply degrade. That's all it can do. If you take a cell and you take away its membrane, a cell cannot produce its own membrane de novo. Just like cells only come from cells, membranes can only come from membranes. So a cell's membrane is inherited from its parents. And the cell can add to it, you know, it can extend it, but no cell has ever produced its own membrane from scratch because it can't. Even if the DNA instructions tell it how to make proteins and phospholipids and so forth, um, it inherits it. So, so are you saying that all the way from sperm, egg, zygote and beyond, the membranes that are duplicated, obviously, is, you know, during replication and such, all of those are, n none of those are de novo. They're exactly. all an extra extension of the original. Is that right? Right. It's kind of like a template that you can grow upon and make more cells from it. But you, no, no cell is capable of creating its own membrane de novo. Now, now, in context of okay, removing abiogenesis, origin of life research from the equation, is the point you made about membranes coming from other membranes and and so on, is that a established, accepted position in in biology? Outside of origin of life, I mean. Yeah, I actually, I mean, that, that quote I gave that uh, membranes only come from membranes, it came from... It came from another book I read. At the moment, I'm blocking on the author, but but yes, it's established. So if you if we went and talked to any anybody else, any other kind of researcher, they would be like, "Oh yeah, exactly. We agree 100." percent And well, then, but then you go and talk to the origin of life researcher. Oh well, it must have just occurred. <laughs> there must be a process, even though all of the observed evidence says the direct opposite. Is that a fair uh, thing to say? I'm talking about in terms of the what we see. It goes along with your point. Mm -hmm. Origin of life would have to be the direct antithesis of that. Yeah, and, it, and this kind of goes back to what I started with, with these two hypotheses. You know, either life began through purely natural processes or it didn't. <laughs> and all of this uh, chicken and egg, right, all these paradoxes that we've been talking about are evidence of the second hypothesis. And I really think it's only by excluding that hypothesis up front 
which is what materialistic thinking or naturalistic thinking does. That's the only way you can have any support for the remaining hypothesis because that's the only one left if you exclude the other one. So, um, so we've been going through a lot of a lot of details. There's still many more. We're not going to go through the others, but um, the point I'm trying to bring back. You know, I said there were two points to this the video. The second point was about sensationalism. It was about kind of ex amplifying or or stretching the truth to make your point. And remember, Dave said there was a little picture of a newspaper on the video, and he said sensationalist reporting of science news no matter which way it leads, is destroying the public perception of science. And I really agree with you, Dave. I agree that's true. And I'm afraid that I think your video is doing that. And it's it's causing people to, to not trust science because it, you're making very strong statements that are not supported. And when people hear that, they're smart enough to know better. So, so it kind of doesn't make sense what Dave is doing here. But at the end of the video, he has a quote that I think helps to explain this. Um, he, he says that um, spontaneous arrival of life through purely natural processes, it runs counter to common sense. Our common sense tells us that this is, that molecules don't just come together and produce a living self-replicating organism. That's common sense. And Dave recognizes that your common sense says it can't happen. So to alleviate that discomfort that your common sense provide, Dave uh, produces at the end of his video, it really is my favorite quote from 2020. So here it is. Common sense has no place in science or in an assessment of the feasibility of biological processes. Okay. Hold it. Hold it there. So Dave said, common sense has no place in science or in an assessment of the feasibility of biological processes. So I guess we should at least give Dave credit for practicing what he preaches. He's asking you to put aside your common sense, um, suppress your thinking, your intuition, and just close your eyes and believe. <laughs> That's what he wants. Love it. <laughs> yeah, he, he wants us to imagine. Um, I'd like to point out too something that uh, I guess just to branch off of something. There's been so many good points and and so many good things said. I've got a ton of notes here. This has been awesome. Time has flown by, but I'd like to point out, like you guys were talking about earlier, that I'm seeing numerous interconnected and just irreducible problems that have no solutions, and these problems need some some type of solution in order to make an origin of life scenario even remotely plausible. So like Rob was saying, hypothesis two, given what we know about all of these numbers of paradoxes, chicken and egg problem after chicken and egg problem, the remaining hypothesis, excluding hypothesis one, is would be the most plausible hypothesis. Exactly. That's what we're left with. <laughs> So, so Rob, I've got. To, I have to ask you this question directly. So, you are a respected researcher. You've created many devices for healthcare. I'm going to assume that the things that you have presented for funding, for uh, grants, for w whatever the process is for pursuing one of the, you know, whatever the concept is. I'm assuming that whatever you presented had to have common sense and had to have a practical and plausible reason of expectation to be accomplished. Is that a fair position? Yeah, that's fair. Would, uh, if you, I know you work in the private sector now, but if, if you were back like in academia, for example, and went for a grant and said, no, I don't think this has any common sense and I don't really have expectation that's plausible do you think it's a remotely plausible scenario that you would actually get funding for that <laughs> well it's plausible you'll be kicked out of the room i suppose <laughs> um, <laughs> you know to, to be a little charitable with what dave said here in this quote i think what he's saying is that sometimes science does produce a result that is counterintuitive right like we all make mistakes in 
predicting that this will be the answer and it turns out you were wrong, right? So humility, humility is a very important part of science. And sometimes things run against what you expect from your common sense. But um, I think Dave is saying it in a stronger way here. Um, and, and I certainly don't agree with the statement that he wrote. So let me get this straight. Professor Dave says that cells can reproduce or uh, produce membranes. They can't. There's no evidence for replication that he states as a fact and that it does happen. That's not true. And then protocells existed, he's saying, that there is no evidence for. All while he's saying that the news is sensationalizing these things while he's doing the very thing he's complaining about. <laughs> Seems pretty <laughs> ironic. You nailed it, Matt. Yep. And I think, honestly, that's why he censored me from uh, putting comments on his video. No doubt. And look what that got him. A whole video. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, one of the things I found most interesting about the uh, the sensationalization from the media and such is, and we didn't get into all of them, obviously, in, in this commentary, but there were multiple components of that video, which I know beyond doubt were pulled directly. The concepts were pulled directly from sensationalized articles, mm -hmm. not peer reviewed papers, but I mean from articles. And part of the reason I knew that is because I've read some of them myself and I recognize some of the points that he was making as them coming directly from uh, different sensationalized publications from, you know, not necessarily from a scientific journal. And one of the one of the reasons I bring this up is something I know that uh, SFT and myself run into many times, and I'm sure you have as well. Um, and people come after you for your books of, you know, when we point out the papers that just like you did uh, tonight that discredit their argument or their position, it seems the next time we run into them, they didn't actually go and read it for themselves to go and see that the position, you know, the argument that we're you're, you're making or we're making is correct. Um, or that their position is not actually supported by the evidence other than maybe, you know, two sentences in the abstract. But when you actually go further into the paper, it turns out that they didn't actually establish the uh, the high level uh, position that was taken in the title or in the first sentence of the abstract. And I, don't know, I, I found that quite a bit. Is that something you recognize as well? For sure. But it's it's very tedious to read the paper, you know, the, <laughs> It's very hard to get at what actually happened in the paper. It takes a lot of time and energy and effort, and it's easier to just read the title and 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 just kind of wash your hands of it. And say, we got the answer here, right? Yeah, it's, I, I think it's kind of interesting. Over the last several months, I've read quite a few different articles from people from journals um, talking about the significant problem with the lack of repeatability. And uh, there was even one, I forget the gentleman's name, but uh, he's, he's, he's refusing to now be an editor and a reviewer of articles or of papers that don't clearly delineate the process that was used to reach the conclusion. And one of the things, you know, from you and I's first uh, conversation, I found very interesting about that. Uh, the editorial I'm referring to was, you know, you were talking about in your research, how, if you can't make it repeatable and you can't clearly show how you reached your conclusion, mm -hmm. then in the medical device example, uh, research field, you're never, you're not going anywhere. And yet somehow in things like origin of life, you know, rather abstract, <laughs> uh, hypothesis you know, theories are put forth with no substance other than it sounds good and has a great storyboard. And, and we have to recognize the, the publication bias, you know, that again, back to this hypothesis one and hypothesis two, where number, number two is that life could not have begun from natural processes. Um, you, you, you just literally cannot publish a peer reviewed paper that supports hypothesis two. It, it will never make it through the peer review process. And if it did, the editors would, <laughs> they would lose their job and you publishing it would probably be blackballed from science and and there are many examples of that i'm not just mr conspiracy theory here there's plenty of examples where that's really the case well let's hear it one more time from professor dave here who violates occam's razor common sense has no place in science <laughs> hear that everybody ignore common sense 
<laughs> That's a well, great way me, to wrap uh, it up. <laughs> yeah, let me jump in here. So I was I was just going to say that. So this was awesome. Uh, we are going on over an hour and 15 minutes now. Time has has flown by. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Rob is an incredible blessing, and I thank him for giving us his time tonight uh, for this important video. So please, everybody watching, make sure to check out his books, The Stairway to Life and The Scientific Approach to Evolution. Uh, any final words from anybody on the panel tonight uh, before we shut it down? Uh, Rob, John, Matt? No, oh, just to thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Um, and I, uh, I, I do in, indeed hope that the people who are subscribed to Professor Dave will will take this seriously and not and not be misled by his hidden agenda. Amen. Amen. Uh, any final words, Matt, John? Yeah, I mean, last thing I'll say is, uh, everybody, I strongly recommend uh, getting both of Dr. Stadler's books. I believe, SFT, you're going to put the links in the description, right? You got and, it. And yep. I uh, strongly recommend you go and check them out. And for any of you who are thinking, hey, we're just being full of hot air and talking and we're just, you know, completely biased, as uh, Professor Dave likes to say, um, go read the books for yourselves. I mean, go look for other research beyond the standard talking points and whether or not you come to the same conclusions we have and the positions that we're taking tonight, uh, I, it's you'll be very hard pressed if you go into it with an open mind to at least not begin to question the, you know, proven beyond all doubt positions that are taken by folks like professor Dave and right. uh, at least begin to potentially question and think for yourself that maybe we don't have all the answers and you should be a little more open mind minded rather than fall for the naturalism, of the gaps uh, answer to all of the, uh, you know, the, the major conundrum of how do we exist, which I think is kind of an important one to uh, consider. Very well said, John. Very well said. That's the perfect place to end it. So I hope everybody enjoyed. I know I enjoyed once again. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stadler, for joining us. Thank you as well, Matt and John. So we are going to call it a night. God bless.